Very good morning. Today we will speak about uh, the most important organ in a human being. It's not the brain, it's not the liver, it's uh, the appendix. Now, in fact, it's a very neglected organ. Uh, most would attribute probably no function, but it has, at least in some patients, a very deadly impact. And uh, Massimiliano Valetti will tell you uh, some more. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the today morning lecture about the neoplasm of the appendix. When I first tried to put my presentation together, I looked in my surgical books and the only information I get was condensed into four pages. Quite a simple topic, you may assume, uh, which is definitely not the case in neoplasm of the appendix, but why are the data and the information so scant? Because the appendicial neoplasia um, is rare. It's never on the radar screen and when it appears it's really on an issue how to proceed. There is no randomized data, there is no standardization, so we really don't know what to do. 1% of the appendectomies will have cancer and this has been reported worldwide even in uh, large studies. The SEER um, has found about 0.12 cases of appendiacial malignancies per 100,000 per year and the most commonly lesion seen was adenocarcinoma. Similar numbers uh, from the Netherlands uh, in this big study at the bottom. In this graphic of Turaga from 2012, uh, an increase in incidence during the last decades has been reported and the cases has more than doubled over the last 13 years. So the confusing thing um, uh, with appendicial neoplasm is really the pathology. There is a lot of terms that have been used, but lately consensus on how to classify these tumors has finally been reached. In fact, in 2012, the PSOGI developed a classification that helps to resolve much of the confusion. Uh, and the last revision of the classification was performed in 2017. If you want to focus more uh, on this complicated topic, I suggest you both papers by Carr. And this of 2017 is really, uh, truly outstanding paper on the topic. So I'm gonna, grow, I'm gonna go through this classification. One is the mucinous neoplasm uh, or AMN without the infiltrative invasions. Of them, the low grade version, the LAM is by far the most common. Then we have the high grade, the version, the HAM. Uh, then we have the regular adenocarcinoma, which is invasive, infiltrative, and has a potential to metastasize. You can have mucinous and non-mucinous lesions with or without signet ring cells. Then we have the Minen, previously Manek, who just got renamed over the last year, the goblet cell carcinomas, the neuroendocrine tumors, and some other rare stuffs, including lymphoma, gists, and others. So the message of this slide is um, that classification and staging matter for these tumors. If you look at the graphic above, you can see the different tumors have different prognosis over the years. The continuous line on the top represent the lumps, and they do well. Um, and at the bottom, you can see the adenocarcinomas in all different settings, and they performed very poorly. And now the mucinous neoplasm, more in details. They are rare, with 1,000 to 2,000 cases annually in the United States, mostly detected in women, and are usually diagnosed in mid-aged patient. These lesions are usually discovered incidentally, and patients are often asymptomatic. The most frequent symptoms are appendicitis-like and other like gastrointestinal bleeding or intestinal obstruction, of course, at most in advanced stage of the disease. Histologically, they do overlap with other appendicial cancer, and you can sometimes think of this uh, like a spectrum of lesions where the therapy is generally dictated by the histology, and so you need a very good diagnosis to properly treat your patient. And another important thing is that the mucinous collection can sometimes rupture, and the result is that mucin spreads into the abdomen. But what does really happen if it spreads? The classing location are the paracolic gutters, the subdiaphragmatic space, the pelvis, the small bowel, and the mesentery, uh, causing the clinical syndrome of seromyxoma peritonei, which is not uh, a disease in itself. Um, the mucine can be acellular, all these tumor cells, and this is important for the prognosis. And then there are other tumors like ovarian tumors and pancreas tumors uh, you have to think about for a differential diagnosis. But the appendicial um, mucinous carcinomes remain the most common cause of pseudomyxoma peritonei. Here you can see a presentation of end-stage pseudomyxoma peritonei with a PCI of 35 and the typical manifestation of the omental cake. 
If you think at the therapy, you first have to split the disease into localized and advanced, including the pseudomyxoma peritonei. If you are talking about localized neoplasm, the resection of all disease with a simple appendectomy is sufficient for many of our patients, if, even if the proximal margin is positive. The right hemicolectomy is a discussed topic and it should be considered for selected patients with high features. And the adjuvant therapy is generally not indicated, especially for patients with low-grade neoplasms. If you have an advanced disease, including the PNP, the most proposed therapy is the cytoreductive surgery with HIPEC. And if you look at the five years overall survival after surgery, the results are really outstanding, with a range from 50 to 80% depending on the histology. And the surgery can be repeated. On your left side, uh, a study from 2012, which shows how good are the outcomes of, after CRS and HIPEC after R0 and even R1 resection, and even after myodebulking, some patients uh, survive for more than 10 years. And on your right side, the graphic shows that even after redo surgery and re hypec we um, still can achieve mm -hmm. very good results. Here I want to show you an unblock resection we were able to perform in our institution three weeks ago. This was a, this was a cytoreductive surgery followed by HIPEC. Uh, the unblock resection includes the right hemicolon, the gallbladder, the greater omentum, the spleen, and um, a lower anterior resection of the rectum. <coughs> So moving on, on the more uh, aggressive um, neoplasm, the adenocarcinoma, they are the most common malignancies with 60% of all appendicial cancers. Uh, nodal involvement is very common and it's different uh, between the subtypes. Well differentiated tumors has a risk of 5%, while poorly differentiated tumors up to 30%. For localized disease, you can perform um, uh, an appendectomy and almost every else needs a right hemicolectomy. Talking about metastatic disease, the neoadjuvant thermotherapy followed by surgery has definitely a role. The treatment is similar to colorectal cancer and the evaluation of mutation uh, could be helpful. The treatment is commonly based on 5-FU therapy like Folfox and Folfiri. And here there is a study from Graz from 2017. They looked after the outcomes of cytoreductive surgery and showed that patient with a lower PCI didn't do that bad and had a good survival over the months. Um, and they have a statistical significance because, um, between the two groups with a PCI greater and, and less than 20 points. And now we will have a look through the menans, the goblet cells, carcinomas, and the neuroendocrine tumors. Mixed neuroendocrine or neuroendocrine tumors mostly seen in the appendix. They are a combination of neuroendocrine carcinoma and adenocarcinoma, and they behave better than adenocarcinoma, but worse than the NETS, as well shown in this study uh, from 2016. About the goblet cell carcinoma, uh, a really important message is that even if neuroendocrine markers are often positive, this is not a NET and this is a carcinoma. And GCC should be classified, staged and treated as appendicial adenocarcinoma. And the prognosis uh, is worse than for malignant neuroendocrine tumors. Here I just want to show um, you the there is a way to classify these rare tumors. I found in the literature this paper from Tang, published in 2008. And the interesting thing is that there are three subtypes of GCC. And if you look at the different prognosis in month, there is a big difference in survival between the three groups. So you need really a good pathology and a correct diagnosis to be able to treat properly all your patient. About the treatment, appendectomy may be sufficient, um, especially for T1 stage, um, and especially if no risk features are present. All other patients should receive a right hemicolectomy, and the cytoreductive surgery should be discussed in selected patient. The nets of the appendix are mostly well differentiated tumors. They often incid are incidentally found and are localized at the top of the appendix. They can metastasize to regional nodes, but even to peritoneum and liver, which is the most common cause of carcinoid syndrome uh, in the appendicial nets. And um, the outcomes following uh, resection of nets, uh, especially for low-grade nets, is outstanding. But the real important question for this tumor is uh, if you have to perform a hemicolectomy or not. And 
there are some considerations which are very important to answer this question. As shown, the size, the grade, the location matters. And another important feature is the mesoappendicial invasion, because 5% of the patient with an invasion greater than 3 millimeters will have nodal recurrence and positive nodes. Now I want you to show um, your, our proposed summary of the treatment option to make it everything more clear. The first you have to do uh, is to choose the correct box. In the first blue box you have the panic condition like mucosyl contained LAM or small neuroendocrine tumors and for these tumors the best way is to perform a simple appendectomy. In the middle box, the yellow one, um, there is for malignant neoplasms uh, like neuroendocrine with high risk features or localized adenocarcinoma and for this tumor the proposed um, operation is the right hemicolectomy and in the red box, the advanced neoplasms like perforated lamps, advanced neuroendocrine and advanced adenocarcinoma. And for this uh, so, um, disease, you have to perform an extensive surgery and perhaps a chemotherapy. And to properly answer um, the question, if you have to perform a hemicolectomy or not for the appendix tumors, look at, look at the two boxes. In the green box, you have the neuroendocrine tumors smaller than 15 millimeters. Um, and without risk factors, mucosyl adenoma, uh, they don't need a hemicolectomy, and that's also mostly true for LAM, HAM, and for some pseudomyxoma peritonei. While in the red box, you have the neuroendocrine tumors bigger than 15 millimeters, or with the risk factors, uh, goblet cell cancer, menin, and, uh, and all high-grade carcinomas, and for these tumors, the colectomy is indicated. And to conclude, um, do not forget the reason why you have to perform an oncological hemicolectomy in some tumors. The iliocolic nodes along the iliocolic vein represent the confluence of lymphatic drainage of the appendix, and you have to be uh, you have to properly resect them to be able to offer the best oncological outcomes and uh, at your patient. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Valetti, thank you very much. I think it's good to have a review of all these conditions because they are rare, but probably one or twice in our career we may, we may see these uh, conditions. When an IPEC or something is considered in this tumor, what's the timing to do it in terms of the diagnosis? So you operate that, you found that uh, uh, in the middle of the night or uh, in an emergency, you see all these uh, this mucus outside of the appendix, what should be done in a practical term? So CRS IPEC is certainly not an emergency operation. Uh, it takes some planning in many patients, uh, given the fact that it represents a metastatic tumor, it often requires systemic treatment. It's not always uh, based on a LAM, these pseudomyxomas. So what I recommend in this situation is take biopsies if it is a very simple appendectomy and you're sure uh, the tumor, that's the, the primary tumor, you can do it, but do um, uh, uh, as little as you can uh, and then um, step back and uh, stage and plan your treatment. Thank you very much, beautiful presentation. Um, I have a question related to um, the follow-up of these patients. It's a very diverse group. In some patients, simple appendectomy is necessary. In others, it's colectomy um, combined with uh, CRS and HIPEC. So what are the recommendations, um, simple recommendations to follow these patients up once their primary therapy has been, or their primary operation has been conducted? Well, it, it highly depends on the diagnosis. In fact, if you have small appendix net, uh, you don't even need to follow up them. Uh, it's done with an appendectomy. The same is true for a mucosyl or a LAMN. And as soon as you get to uh, carcinomas, goblet, mucinous, signet ring, you do the same as you would do for a colon cancer. Um, so look at, the, look at the primary disease and stage and, and then you get the answer. Would we still need, um, would we still need endoscopies to follow them up even though it's, it's an appendiceal disease? Yeah. Would you advise to do that? That's a very interesting or an important question. Um, you didn't show that, but in the Netherlands series, they find 10% of uh, secondary colorectal tumors. So it's uh, actually recommended to do a colonoscopy before you treat them extensively. And I would also follow, uh, in a follow-up, I would do it as for colon cancer. So do a colonoscopy in one year after resection and then depending on what you found. 
Would you lose a word on incidental appendectomy from a surgical oncologist's point of view? Um, that's, uh, I had these slides in my presentation. That's a rather philosophical question. I think it's not wrong to do it because the incidence is one in thousand uh, patients and many of our, uh, the nets that we see discussed in our tumor board are actually incidental findings. On the other hand, some people say that the appendix has a physiological function in order to re-establish the intestinal flora. So it's probably um, a matter of um, a personal view whether you uh, consider the appendix as a neglectable organ or not. But it's certainly not wrong. I think it's, it's okay to do it. Okay, thank you.